One thing I love doing is experimenting with differential equations. We can often construct interesting equations using fairly simple ingredients. And those equations could be interesting because of their structure or because of their solution development or, in case we're lucky, because of both structure and solution development. For example, I solved this one a while back that had the derivative of the function appearing as an exponent of the function itself. And we got a pretty cool solution development involving the Lambert W function. Today we're going to be talking about a couple of very interesting cases. One is the sine of the derivative of a function equaling the cosine of the function itself. And the second case is the same question but for the inverse functions. For the first equation, notice that we can write the cosine term on the right as sine of pi by 2 minus y. And that gives us the equality of two sine functions. So we can write that dy by dx equals pi by 2 minus y. But the sine function is 2 pi periodic. That means we have an extra factor of 2 pi k, where k is an integer. So writing this as dy by dx plus y equal to factoring out the pi by 2 gives me 4k plus 1 times pi by 2, which is a Bernoulli equation that we can solve using a nice integrating factor. And to determine that, we have e to the integral of the coefficient of this linear term in y. And that coefficient is just 1. So we have the integral of 1 with respect to x, giving us the integrating factor of e to the x. Now expanding using our integrating factor, we have e to the x times dy by dx plus e to the x times y, which we recognize as the derivative with respect to x of y times e to the x and on the right, we have 4k plus 1 times pi by 2 times e to the x. Now integrating with respect to x gives us y times e to the x equal to 4k plus 1 times pi by 2 times e to the x plus a constant of integration c. And now expanding using e to the negative x, we have y equal to 4k plus 1 times pi by 2 plus c times e to the negative x. So our first differential equation here has infinitely many solutions. Now the second equation is actually pretty simple. All it needs is some basic trigonometry and it doesn't even matter what inverse trig functions are involved. I mean I can even replace this thing with the inverse secant function and the solution development will follow exactly the same approach. Let me show you what I'm talking about. We have the inverse sine of the derivative equal to some junk on the right-hand side. This implies that the derivative itself equals the sine of that junk. So we need the sine of the inverse secant of y. And we can use some trigonometry here to express that quite nicely. We're going to call the inverse secant of y some angle phi, and this means that the secant of phi is y, and now that we have the secant, that means we have the cosine as well, so cosine phi is 1 by y. Now that we have the cosine, we can work our way towards the sine as the square root of 1 minus the squared cosine, which is 1 by y squared in this case. So that means we have the sine of phi, phi being the inverse secant of y, equal to the square root of y squared minus 1 by y. Okay, cool. So this means our differential equation sorts out to dy by dx equal to square root y squared minus 1 divided by y, which is a pretty simple separable differential equation. So let me write this as y dy divided by the square root of y squared minus 1. And here I have dx. And integrating the whole thing gives me, on the left-hand side, I'll just have y squared minus 1. And on the right, we'll have x plus a constant of integration c. And this implies that y squared minus 1 equals x plus c whole thing squared, 
And this means that y itself equals 1 plus x plus c squared. And using the square root, of course, we have both positive and negative square roots. Okay, cool. This was a pretty nice math snack. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.